Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, it's my experience that the youngest speaker always gets asked to talk last, so uh, I'm pleased uh, about that honour. Um, I wanted to tell you about uh, chemical uh, gardens, and I wouldn't mind if the next slide worked, but it doesn't seem to. There are three ways to make this work. We either do this. Yeah. Or we can make this work. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Oh. Okay. This is an interesting area, I think, in part because it needs quite a number of uh, different subjects to really uh, come uh, through. And then it leads to a field that's known as uh, chemobryonics, and uh, that's really a, an emerging field and of uh, great interest. Right. A summary of what I'm going to say is that chemical gardens are self-assembled inorganic uh, precipitates. They form from a crystalline seed, as you'll see, of cobalt chloride or other salts, but cobalt chloride, uh, sort of the standard and easiest one, in an aqueous solution of sodium silicate or something uh, like that. There's a reaction between uh, the cations of cobalt and the anions of silicate, and they form, as you'll see in a minute, a, a semi-permeable uh, precipitate that grows and looks like a plant. And that's exactly why it's called chemical gardens. They were first found uh, in uh, the oceanic hydrothermal uh, vents, uh, and it's been suggested that that's related to the emergence of life. And that's how we get these chemical gardens being the origin of uh, life. Because it's chemistry, we really have to start with uh, Isaac uh, Newton, who in some sense was the first uh, chemist. He uh, lived in this little cottage that uh, you see uh, here. Uh, and some people came and dug up the gardens the other day, just a year or so ago. Uh, he wasn't around to uh, complain. I've also got here a, a photograph of a chemical garden where you see in this uh, circular cylinder, there's uh, been that reaction that I wrapped out uh, for you and forms this system. And that's that which we want to understand uh, better. The first uh, person who uh, really worked on chemical gardens is uh, this uh, man uh, here. He was a German Dutch uh, alchemist. He is said to be the first chemical engineer. Um, he was strongly motivated by things that happened in the 30 year war. And these are uh, little photographs that uh, Ming Chun very kindly gave me of the 30 years war. He grew the first chemical gardens in 1646. And whatever any of you thought, I wasn't around then, it was well before my time. But he wrote 40 books, isn't that uh, terrific? He was married twice. His second wife had eight children. And now I'm gonna say rather softly, why did he work on chemical gardens and not contraceptives, which I think might've been just a little bit more relevant to his uh, life. Um, another, most, uh, another person who's uh, worked uh, on uh, the origin of life is uh, Bernal, <coughs> and I could tell you lots and lots of Bernal, he's a fascinating uh, character, and he had lots to uh, say, but not so much on the fluid mechanics and <coughs> the chemistry. But the real question is, where did life on Earth uh, begin? It said sometimes in little ponds on the surface of uh, the earth. The other possibility, which I in some sense want to emphasize and talk a lot about is on hydrothermal vents. These vents that occur at the bottom of the ocean, four or five uh, kilometers deep and, and grow chemicals like uh, that. And the argument is that that was the beginning of uh, life on uh, Earth. Here's a modern photograph of a so-called black smoker um, that were discovered in 1977 near the uh, Galapagos. 
chemical gardens and the interesting aspect of it is that you don't need or you don't have either sunlight or oxygen, but you can still grow things. Just as an aside, I'd like to say that uh, the discovery of uh, these uh, black smokers in 1977 was done from a submersible that came out of Woods Hole, where I worked quite a lot. And the submersible took a captain, a driver in a sense, and two scientists. It's really very small. I once asked uh, one of the scientists who had quite a lot of experience on uh, submersible, what if you need to go to the toilet? And he smiled and said, you don't. <laughs> but two scientists and one pilot, three scientists have said to me they were there on that original discovery of the black smokers. When the third person said it to me, well, I couldn't tell. He might have been telling the truth, who knew? They're now become so well known that uh, they're easily made uh, without an, a lot of understanding in the circular cylinders you see here, and you can even buy them for your uh, children. So your children can uh, make these uh, magic uh, rocks. There was a conference uh, just over 10 years ago uh, that uh, was run by uh, Julian Cartwright, who's uh, played an important role in uh, my education. Uh, and also, I like saying that the fourth name here is Raymond Goldstein, who, uh, who's uh, turned up a lot in uh, um, other uh, talks. Well, what I want to do really is say the easiest way to do the experiments is in a cylindrical glass beaker, but that's difficult to analyze and really come to grips with. So what is easier is to do it in a Healy Shaw cell, which as you mostly uh, know, uh, involves simpler uh, fluid mechanics and simpler uh, mathematics. And that's what I'm going to do here. And a typical experiment is uh, done in a Healy Shaw cell that you uh, see here. That's uh, the uh, size. Okay, now in Healy Shaw cells, uh, you can really uh, have two different sorts of chemical gardens uh, growing. Uh, and you see photographs here of the results of chemical gardens in a uh, Healy Shaw cell. This happens to be a round one, that happens to be a square one. It doesn't make any difference, but it just has a little bit of influence in uh, the mathematics that you uh, might do. And you could either have solutions of both the positive and negative aspect that uh, you want, and you could inject either one or the other one and see what uh, happens, or you could have a pellet. So you have a solid pellet and you inject fluid into it. And that's a little easier to understand. And here you see an example of it, just a sketch, but I'll expand on it in a minute. You have a cobalt chloride pellet and you put in sodium silicate and the cobalt is going to uh, react with the uh, silicate. And that's what you want to uh, know about. Here's just a uh, diagram of uh, the experimental uh, setup. I don't think we need to go through this uh, much, but this is now an indication of uh, the results as a function of time in seconds going along uh, this way. So we have something like a hundred minutes uh, here. Uh, and here is the concentration uh, that's uh, being used and uh, increased. And what you see, if it's rather weak, rather only 0.05, it grows a little bit with time, but not very spectacularly in any way. But as the concentration increases, then you really get some spectacular growth in this Healy Shaw cell. Of course, if it was in the cylinder, it would, if you like, be uh, more spectacular. Now, this is as you increase the uh, concentration of 
cobalt chloride, you see it really begins to uh, grow and uh, is uh, really quite uh, spectacular and different from one case to another. And I can't help but saying, you know, when we grow, we're all different, one from the other. Not one of us in this room looks like anybody else in the uh, room. Thank God the father and son have gone. Otherwise, I'd have got into trouble with that comment. <laughs> This is now for the experimental result as a function of time, again in uh, seconds. So this is uh, 100 minutes uh, here. Um, and you see the pressure gradually grows up. And then there's really a very large increase and in explosion, which you see, whoops, it happens at uh, 6,000 seconds. So that's just uh, here. The pressure gradually grows up. These three tend to be in more or less uh, the uh, same pressure as you see here. And then the reaction, the chemical reaction is such that you get quite a considerable uh, explosion. Instead of using uh, cobalt chloride, you could use magnesium chloride and you get really the uh, similar, similar result. Life can start in a, whoops, a number of different ways. Um, this is now uh, an indication of uh, what the time taken using different chemicals uh, is uh, as a function of uh, the uh, concentration. And this is, uh, shows you how the time can really increase depending on the different concentration. This is basically really a, a similar uh, result. This only seems to work sometimes. Oh, okay. Now, what we're going to uh, do is show you some analysis of this, where we have the circular pellet to start with, and then a reaction that uh, forms and in this, uh, simplification it's all axisymmetric, symmetric but what we're going to show and what you've already seen is uh, that uh, there's a shock that uh, occurs um, and if we had a simple version of a equivalent cylinder or equivalent circle sorry then the area because it's not a perfect circle as you see we have an equivalent radius that's given by the square root of the area over pi. And then we'll uh, define a uh, width w, which uh, is the equivalent width of the fluid that's outside this pellet. So this is the equivalent width here that we want to understand. Here's a sketch of this, here's the area. And that's going to give us a radius. And then we're going to make a circular uh, description of uh, that. Why does this only sometimes work? Okay. So the uh, growth rate has uh, been uh, shown by some early experiments by uh, Ding to go like the square root of time. No surprise there because it's controlled by diffusion. And all diffusion processes more or less go like uh, the square root of time. But then, uh, as we say, it uh, uh, expands. Okay, but now we can take into account the fact that there's diffusion here and an interaction, and we can write down basically a conservation of volume, if you like, or conservation of, that looks like this. Uh, differential equation which we can uh, solve and we can model that there's basically a relatively linear change at first of this uh, width as a function of time and then of course when the explosion comes it uh, increases really quite dramatically and this is a nice indication of how in the Healy Shaw cell you can come to grips with what's really going on, where if it was in a circular cylinder, it would be difficult to look at uh, um, mathematically. This just uh, shows you the results on a graph uh, varying uh, silicate uh, concentration. 
and uh, how the rate of increase of the uh, width uh, goes. Uh, that's uh, some detail. But I'd like to uh, just uh, end with some take home messages that uh, the inorganic precipitates chemical gardens important because uh, they're possibly uh, the beginning of life. They grow and look like a uh, plant. What I talk to you about mainly here is the growth in a horizontal heliosaur cell where you put in the uh, fluid through the snow. The diffusion dynamics plays an important uh, role and the growth of precipitates can be analyzed uh, that uh, way. We're going to uh, write a paper, it's not yet uh, finished, but it's uh, begun. Uh, as you see here, the title's already been chosen, or we think the title's already been chosen, and uh, the uh, authors, Ming Chan here, <coughs> Silvana Cardoso, who was uh, in my Institute of Theoretical Geophysics quite some time ago, and now is in chemical engineering in uh, Cambridge, uh, Julian Cartwright, who works in uh, Spain, and Alexander Ralph, who's uh, also a uh, chemical engineer. I'd like to thank in uh, particular uh, Julian and Ming Chan, who've uh, really been very influential in my uh, learning uh, about uh, this, and Ming Chan is uh, doing some of uh, the experiments. And I'd particularly like to thank you all for listening.